started. Um, just a, a note up front, Josh and I talked about kind of how we want to go about this. We want to keep it as informal as possible. Um, always enjoy a dialogue with people that know stuff I want to know more about rather than being talked about. So we're going to um, try to throw up some stuff and show you some things that we've tried and that's kind of what we're doing. A lot of basic principles, but we invite questions whenever and wherever. Hopefully, we want you to be talking as much as us as possible. So, that we get started. Uh, probably all got all that information on West Central Indiana uh, near Attica. It's um, about 20 miles southwest Lafayette, an hour northwest of here. Um, our, our soils vary a lot. We've got everything from gravel hills to really high organic matter, flat, clay, lumpy stuff. Tell uh, my soil science background when I use technical terms like <laughs> But, uh, you know, I just want you, I think it's important to understand that we're using the system on a wide variety of situations and acres. Um, I guess to start with, you know, maybe a good idea, and, and it's probably some repetition. We've already been here in the last day and a half. But reasons why we want to plant cover crops. You, know, you heard them talk about the five principles, you know, the living root, minimal disturbance, armor over the soil, um, these kind of things. I think what you see here is a lot of things that play into that. And the first is the living root. And understand that the soil's ability to work for us instead of us always having to provide everything to plant the soil to do that, but it takes rebuilding those mycorrhizal networks, sort of the internet or the underground root systems, to be able to get that done. And you can't have that or you're going to diminish that greatly if you don't have a living root out in the field as much as possible. So that's like the first principle that we really try hard to work at. And it's, it's not easy. I mean, obviously, we have a couple months in the winter where things get going. Um, it's hard. Get in after the combine, it's also a year like this when we have such a late harvest to get things established. But you know, that's always the goal, and we're always trying to do our best. The uh, closer that you can come, the quicker you can rebuild these networks and <coughs> your soil will start doing things for you instead of you having to wait on anything. But um, the armor, soil protection um, sounds easy. What we found is that as we get our, our soils, our biological activity really going, that um, we consume so much residue that it, it, it's really become quite a challenge. And I'll show some pictures later that will uh, show some of that. But uh, you hear people talk about, well, no till corn after corn, no till corn, it's hard because of all the residue that build up. Well, usually, a year after corn, if we go out in the field in July, there's all this stuff in the so once you get your biology function, it's it much more challenging to keep resident in the surface. Like that. That's important, like we talked yesterday, you know, these microbes that are the workers in the soil are soil livestock. You know, we, we need to keep you know, they're sensitive to temperature. And, you know, when, when our plants are trying to reproduce and then fill pods and years, that's the hottest time of year. And we've got bare soil there, uh, that temperature is going to shoot up and they're going to shut down. And you're left, that plus guy to survive on the bus there. So if we want the soil to continue to keep, we need to try to keep as much armor. And not only for the biology, but also just protection from erosion, wind, and all the other things that are in the known for a long time. Carbon accumulation, you know, we know most of the soils country have lost half or more of their organic matter. Why is that important? Well, that carbon is the fuel of the soil, but it also, you know, the easiest way to monetize some of this is to think about um, what are our limiting factors in this year. Uh, the most common limiting factor we have is water. We usually lack up during the period of time. And the more carbon we have, the bigger our tank is that we can store more water 
case in point would be uh, 2014 or 15. I think we had a phenomenal corn growth year. We raised a record crop better than anything we've ever seen or hoped to see. And yet, even in that almost perfect season, we went three weeks during July during pollination and air fill without any water. And as we're going through the field, we've got fields with very organic matter levels. Uh, you know, you can see a lot of stuff over 300 down in the low background where we had, you know, four or five, even six percent organic matter flavors. And as we get up to the hills where maybe it's only two and a half to three, you know, it would drop over 100 bushels. And then we'd be down to 200. Well, 200 is nothing to sneeze at. But even in almost an almost perfect year, that extra organic matter with the difference of over 100 bushels an acre, when you look at what that does to your bottom line, it's exponential. You know, if we're making money at 200 bushels, what's happening at 300? So, uh, putting that carbon back in the soil is, is one of the primary things that we're really focused on. Um, we know uh, from work that Dr. Jerry Hatfield did down uh, back in the late 80s and 90s that. size of our water tank and that's a oversimplification but one I think we can all relate to and have seen on our own farm so uh, that's a that's a big goal for us diversity this is the one that I, I struggle to put dollar value on um, because we don't have a long track record with it and it's harder to trace and quantify but I think it may be uh, even more important than about anything else up there. Um, within the context of our commodity system, you know, corn and beans uh, and maybe a little wheat, it's really tough to get uh, diversity into that system. And we're able to use cover crops to do it. Um, we've even gone so far as to put a lot of wheat back in our rotation specifically so that we get a chance to go out there with enough growing season left that we can plant a 10, 12, 15 way cocktail. And even though that's a poor approximation of a natural prairie, which is what we're trying to emulate, it's, uh, it's our best option to try to get that, that diversity back in the system. And as you increase diversity, disease pressure, insect pressure, uh, just a lot of our agronomic challenges just start to fade away. And so uh, this is something that's relatively new to us, but and tracking people have been doing it longer, I, I see great opportunities as, as we continue down the road of diversity. Um, along with that is grazing opportunities. You know, um, like I said earlier, the carbon on the surface is, is important for armor on the soil, but it's not, it's the roots that are really building our organic matter. So we know that when we graze some of those cover crops, 
that something additive also happens, that we change the way plants exude carbon and stuff back into the, the, the rhizosphere. And so uh, instead of looking at it as taking something away, we're actually adding to the process and accelerating it when we're, when we're able to graze. And you know, after two generations on our farm of tearing fences out, and I've, I've, I've helped tear out miles of fence, we're actually starting to build them back because we see the value of having the animal back out there. Um, a, it, it gives us a way to monetize our diversity, and B, it, it's additive to it. Um, with cover crops, we found we can grow a lot of our own nitrogen. Um, uh, it's probably been seven or eight years ago now. We had a great open winter, and we were playing around with crimson clover at the time, and I had some whole fields. I'd never do this today, but they were just straight crimson clover, and I thought, what a great opportunity to, to learn about how much nitrogen we can produce. And um, Dr. Eileen Kladipko, who's in the audience today, was, was good enough to send down some grad students and collect samples. And we laid out some protocols of some different timings. We wanted to know, you know we know agronomically, the longer we let that cover crop go in the spring, you know, or some of our risks go up or challenges. We wanted to look at different timings and how much nitrogen we could produce that way. Bottom line, um, we were producing 70 pounds of nitrogen between corn crops and changing the biology of the soil. And this is at a time when we were doing a lot of corn after corn, so that was a pretty neat trick. And as we look at other value-added markets, you know, like organic corn, which uh, a friend of mine selling for $9 picked up on the farm right now, one of the big challenges to that is, you know, getting enough nitrogen in the soil to, to feed that corn crop. And, Cover crops are one very good way we can, we can accomplish that. And weed control, you're gonna see some pictures here too. Um, what we found is we've increased diversity, increased cover, increased the armor, all these things that our weed pressure just keeps going down, down, down. To the point that I would say now, um, our cereal rye is, is better, it gives us better weed control than about anything we can buy in a jug particularly on some really tough weeds like mare's tail that chemically we just don't have any great solutions for. What's your row spacing? Row spacing on our soybeans? On your cereal rye. Um, mostly seven and a half inch drill. Uh, we've got a, a cedar you'll see a picture of here in a minute that does a broadcast pattern as well. This is the field I was telling you about that, that uh, Purdue came down and, and, and collected samples and helped us determine what kind of nitrogen production we're getting from the cover crop. And if you've ever had a chance to plant into a clover like that, it is amazing. It just exploded apart like a garden. I mean, there's, there's nothing better to plant into than that. Unfortunately for us, uh, getting crimson clover to survive the winter like that is about a one year and five if we're lucky. I think the winter we, we got that, we had snow cover from about this time of year all the way through March. It's those Arctic blasts on uncovered crops that really do in a lot of our legumes and, and something like annual ryegrass in our area. So uh, I wish we're, we're, we're constantly looking for the holy grail of a legume that we can plant after harvest in the fall that will consistently survive winter and be able to do this for us in the spring. And uh, we haven't found it yet. This is a field, in Indiana we have a, a conservation cropping systems initiative, CCSI. There's a dozen farmers like myself across the state that are cooperating to do plots for different kinds of research. On our farm, we have blocks like you see in the background there where we use no cover. So these, these areas every year in this test, whatever we're doing in that field, we never put a cover in that block. This field happens to be first year transitional organic soybean. So there's been no herbicide sprayed anywhere in this field. And the difference between the relatively clean beans you see in the foreground and that mess you see in the background is our cereal rye crop, which we allowed to grow up, head out, um, and is as pollinated, and we rolled it down with a crimper roller and planted into that. So the weed control we're getting there is 100% from our cover crop. Um, some basic principles. Uh, earlier planting gives us more diverse options. Um, like I alluded to earlier, you know, when you're finishing shelling corn in November, your options for diversity are pretty limited in our part of the world. You know, cereal rye, cereals, um, maybe some um, 
rape type thing. That, that's about all that's left in our toolbox at that point. Um, but we can create op opportunities to add diversity by looking at earlier, earlier maturing soybean varieties and corn hybrids. And like I said, in our case, we've actually started growing a lot more wheat. Everybody says, well, that's crazy. Wheat, you can't make any money raising wheat. And they're kind of right. Obviously, if you do the numbers on a wheat budget, it, it doesn't compare favorably with corn and soybeans. But if you start to look at what that diverse cover crop does to our soil and its subsequent effects on the next corn and soybean crops, and you bring that, you know, in our case, we feel like 10% increase in yield is pretty conservative. And so if you're in a 200 bushel corn environment and you take 20 bushel of corn at, at $4 or whatever, that's $80 an acre. Soybeans, uh, you know, uh, five, six bushels of soybeans at $10, and you bring that and, and bring that back into your wheat budget, all of a sudden wheat starts to compare much more favorably. And in the process, we've lowered up a lot of our costs because we've grown some nitrogen, we're reducing weeds, we're able to not have Band-Aids like GMOs to cover for our poor agronomic practices. Um, you know, we can really cut our costs and increase our production simultaneously, and that has a pretty powerful effect on your bottom line. Um, when you start to uh, consider cover crops, like in our case, cereal rye is our weed control program for next year's soybeans, consistency becomes very important to us. And I'm about as anal now about my cover crops and getting a perfect stand and the right population now as I am with my cash crops. Which means that we're not very excited about flying things on or you know, putting stuff out there early, it really mostly means we're, we're gonna drill it because it's that important to have a perfect stand and there is no other method I've found that is as consistent as that drill. So consistency is something we're, we're kind of uh, uh, crazy about sometimes. Um, we want to design these, you know, in our system, we want to design these mixes so that we've, we've got something growing out there. I know it's really popular, a lot of equip plans, that what they want to do is they want to, they get their payment, they're going to throw stuff out there and they want it all to winter kill because they don't want to have to manage it in the spring. Well, that's leaving your soil uncovered and you're losing a lot of sunlight accumulation, carbon accumulation opportunity by not having something that'll survive winter and go through it. So we're always trying to, to have mixes that have some things that might winter kill and some things that uh, will survive winter and give us some cover and armor and protection and, and keep accumulating carbon in the spring. Uh, I call this a microbial party. That's, that's a picture of one of our cocktail mixes after wheat. And you know, there's 12 different plants in there. You can see the, the buckwheat is what's flowering and, and that brings in the bees and the butterflies and, and you got some sorghum sedan there. You've got some cowpeas and radishes and they just, there's so many good things going on there, and I, I just, uh, somebody talked yesterday about, uh, again, it was Jimmy, about how he has a peaceful feeling when he goes out and moves his cattle. Well, when I go out and walk through this, I, I, I know what he's talking about. Um, so that same field, this is a picture, that's, that picture is probably taken in early September. This picture is taken in about the third week in October. That's my youngest son there. Um, giving it some scale. And so in this field, we, we had a 124 bushel wheat crop. Uh, we put some hog manure on. We didn't take any straw off. We planted this 12-way mix, and we grew this biomass. And I'm starting to wonder, how in the world am I going to plant into this? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little scared. You know, I've watched other people do it, but this is this is successful beyond my imagination, okay? And then I'm, I'm starting to wonder if we're gonna be a, a little too successful and uh, how this is gonna work. And this was the winter I went on my fellowship that we talked about yesterday. And so a lot of times when you're on the road, you don't sleep so well, you wake up, your wheels start turning. Well, a lot of what woke me up was thinking about how, how in the world am I gonna get through this? This is right on a major state highway. A lot of people watching first cocktail ever done in our area and people are driving by wondering what the hell is that and uh, you know so I, I internalize that pressure to me that, that just that's motivation that, that that makes me really want to make sure that there's not a failure here because I know everybody's gonna see it and I'm gonna set back 
everything we're trying to accomplish with encouraging other people if this doesn't go well. Um, as it turned out, it, it, it went beautifully. Um, all, the only thing I did different to my planter is I got the, the zip ties out and uh, I went across it and got every hydraulic line, wiring harness, everything I could strap tight because the leftovers from the sunflower stalks especially were pretty tough and they, they could rip anything off there. Uh, but other than that, it planted like a garden. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, I didn't touch it. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do any tillage. I didn't do any spraying. I didn't do any rolling, nothing. We planted right into it. And this shot was taken in that same field. That's about the 15th of June. And if you look at the ground there, there's still some cover there. But where did all that biomass go? I mean, 125 bushel wheat straw. I don't know how many, if anybody can tell me, I don't, I don't know what, how many tons, how to estimate what was growing there in the picture of my son, but it had to be over 10,000 pounds. And yet, it's all gone. And you know, this was the result I was hoping for and the, the corn had a glow, I'll call it a glow about it, a color that even the harshest critics driving by had to admit that's pretty special. Um, but we failed on the account of the armor over the soil. I thought, man, we've done it now, we're gonna have armor. And by the time this corn pollinated and started to set an ear, it was probably 80% bare dirt down there. That's microbial activity, that's, that's your biology churning away. How many years have you been doing cover on that particular piece? That piece had been ridge tilled since the mid 80s and no tilled since 1990 and probably covers on it um, for 10 years. That was the first cocktail though. So, excuse me? Yeah, so, yeah, so most of the question is, did we let it winter kill? And a big part of the mix had, um, had things that did winter kill. I had clover in there, which was what I was hoping would survive in the spring. We had some, but we didn't get very good survival. Another thing we've learned is that legumes after hog manure, they just don't survive. Uh, if, you, if you've got a big dose of nitrogen like that, the grasses, the other plants in the mix just have such an advantage over them that they don't do very well. So if we want to get a legume to survive in that mix, we got to lay off the manure. Any row cleaners or anything on the planter? Any row cleaners on the planter? Yes, we do have row cleaners on the planter. I don't know how necessary they are. Um, we plant a lot with them up. I've got air control of them so I can put them where I want them. But uh, in that case, we did have them lightly scratching. I, I like them to where I can look back and see them <coughs> stopping turning occasionally. I, I don't want them. I don't want to plow with them. Yes, sir. What other plants in those cocktails? So you mentioned the sunflowers, not your things around your planter. What other plants would be trouble like that? Uh, the sunflowers. There were some sorghum sedan stalks still sticking up. Um, those were probably the two main ones. Those sunflower stalks are still pretty tough. Yes, sir. How was the hog manure applied? Um, our, we use a drag line. We've got a guy that comes in, custom does it with a drag line. He's patented his own coulter-based system. So uh, he's got basically three coulters running and they kind of throw a little dirt out and the hog manure gets injected and they throw it back. So it's, it'll go through any kind of residue and it does very minimal disturbance. And it's a little rough to plant after if you don't do anything to it, but you can, as long as you slow down, we get along all right. Um, we've tried different seeding methods through the years. You've read and seen all these. We've done some inner seeding at V5. We've done aerial seeding. We've done high clearance seeding. We've broadcast. We, we call, do what I call broadcast and scratch, which you'll see a piece of equipment we use now to do that. Ver vertical seeding, um, that's kind of a variation on the broadcast. That's using a vertical tillage tool to, to scratch it in. And then the drill. And 90, well, probably 70% of our stuff gets drilled and 30% gets done on a, you know, a lot of things we want to broadcast instead of in rows so we're trying to use that tool some for that. Now, this is our first cover crop. This We thought this would be inexpensive, fast, and a great way to seed covers and at that time our hog manure was getting applied and, and, and it 
was leaving the field a little rough, so we wanted something that would maybe level just a little bit. Um, it worked okay, as long as you get a rain. You know, if it's really dry, uh, you're not getting seed down into the soil. Uh, the Phillips arrow has a nasty habit of wanting to windrow residue kind of in the center. We could never totally adjust that out either. So uh, some shortcomings, but it's fast and cheap. Uh, we took the same uh, um, Valmar box off that Phillips and, and tried the, the, the Salford, and, and it works really well. Again, <coughs> it does a great job of distributing seed, but um, you're dependent on rain to get things germinated and started. And if you're busting your butt to plant an early maturity to get corn off and get something growing uh, in the 1st of October and you do it and then it doesn't rain for three weeks, this method is you're going to lose some valuable time. This is our present rig. It's, it's again uh, kind of a vertical tillage tool that you can really fine tune adjust your depth and you go really fast with it and it, even you can run it just a half inch to an inch deep and it's thrown up like a rooster tail at the back and we're throwing the seed in. It does a great job of, of distributing that seed and getting it down in, um, you know, in the soil. Um, we tried some bio, I called it bio-till, where we went out with a 30-inch planter. This is back when crop insurance was, was telling us that we needed to plant corn, 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 corn. So we're trying to figure out how to biologically do that. And we were using a, our, our 60 foot corn planter to plant radishes down the middle of corn rows and then plant corn back in that radish track the next year. There's a picture of what, what the, that looked like. And you know, on, on, uh, on flatter ground, that, that works pretty well. I wouldn't recommend that practice on sloping ground because that radish really, like another technical term here, puffs the soil out and makes it um, susceptible. If you get a big rain, you can get water running down that, that track. We've done some interseeding at V5, just going out and broadcasting, and, and we have good success a lot of times getting it started. We've got a nice start. We've got annual ryegrass and some, uh, some clover and uh, I think radish in this mix here. Um, we've never gotten that to survive um, the canopy and be present in the fall. The only, the only time, every time we've done it, uh, if you have a stand disruption for any reason, you've got a beautiful green patch going, but and, and where our corn is doing what we want it to do, we have nothing. It all dies before harvest. So we're, we're still playing with this. We think maybe we need to try it back up to V3, possibly. Chemical interactions are a real challenge to this. If you're using a conventional herbicide program, you're really limited. And this is what I call the unfortunate truth. Drills are not fun. They're expensive. They're a pain in the butt to work on but there's no escape in the fact that the, the, the consistent seed to soil contact we get from this is back to that consistency, consistency factor, the best we've got. Termination methods, we've winter killed, we've chemical killed, we're using the crimper roller now a lot, and uh, we're gonna play around with some mowing using a disc mower. Um, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. This is uh, one of our favorites right now. This is the crimper roller taking down cereal rye, and that's the system we used in that picture earlier where I showed you where there were no herbicides and we had perfect clean beans where the rye was. This is how we do that. You're planting after you roll it. Uh, are we planting after we roll it? Um, <coughs> we've tried it different ways. We've planted, we've gone out and planted and then rolled. Uh, we've gone out and rolled and then planted. If you're going to roll first and then plant, it's probably pretty important that your, your planting device match that and you're using something like RTK GPS so you can you can repeat those passes going the same direction is going to make it work a lot better. Uh, one reason we like coming in afterwards is we can plant into the standing stuff and then come roll it down after it and, and we don't have that issue. So this has already been planted? Uh, this particular field has not been planted. We're using RTK and, and, and we'll transfer those passes over to our planter <coughs> tractor and, and we'll make sure we're on the same direction, follow the exact same path that the roller went. Yes, sir. Have you had results where you just planted into a, a tall standing crop like this, cereal rye, and then cr or against crimping it? I guess letting it stand or crimping it? Yeah, so uh, we, we've done a lot of that. We, we've, we've been planting green for years, and uh, but in, that, in a chemical, 
termination system, we, we didn't let it get this big. We never let it go to head. So it's not necessarily an apples and apples. Um, this gives us better weed control. <coughs> we get good weed suppression with that system, but with this, we get really good control. Dan, how, how do you address uh, early planted soybeans typically are going to give us a little better return? And you're waiting to come to head yeah. here. What, how do you address that? That is a challenge, particularly as you move north, you know, because the roller only works when you're in thesis, when, when, the, when, the, when the rye is shedding pollen. The way you know it's time to go is if you have to stop and blow your radiator out about every two or three hours, you're hitting it about right. And there's a lot of pollen out there. It's, if you're sensitive to that, that's an issue. <coughs> but so uh, Dr. Silva, who's in the room with us today, has had the courage to go out and actually play with planting early, letting the beans come up, and then come back and crimp it. And uh, when I first heard that, I thought, that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, th you got three years in now, four? Three years. And I think in our part of the world, probably eight to nine years out of ten, what you're saying would be accurate that by using the post termination method, we'll go out and plant green as the, you know, I like planting into the rye when it's vegetative because then it's helping me dry out the soil. And it's a lot easier to get the slot closed and just planting goes a lot better if we're planting when this stuff's a little smaller. And then wait and let the beans come up, let, let it reach the right stage and then come in and roll it. That's, that's. Two inches. Well, uh, somewhere between V1 and V3. We think we want to have it done before V3, and we don't think we really want to be out there before V1 if we can help it. Yeah. Okay. Again, you're, you're locking yourself into a sensitive timing window that Mother Nature, uh, but, but you know, you'd be surprised. We did some this year where we had to get it done, and uh, you know, we went through standing water in some places. I'm not proud of that but we didn't leave ruts or tire tracks hardly at all. It's you really, when you get that much biomass, you've got a lot to support you there. Hey Dan, what does, yes. what's your seeding rate on cereal rye? Seeding rate on cereal rye, if, if, if we're conventional and we're gonna use herbicide, we usually use a bushel. Uh, in the organic system, like what you saw there, where we're trying to use that as our total weed control, we'll bump it up to two bushels, and maybe a little more if we're getting later in the season when we're planting. Uh, uh, are we able to adjust the height on the crimper roller? No, ma'am. When you unfold it, the way that toolbar works, when you unfold it in the field, it's on the ground. It has no wheels or anything. And you don't raise it off the ground until you leave the field and put it back in transport mode. Other rollers might work different, but this one, it's always down. Um, you know, planting, you know, we've all heard about planting brown, planting green. Um, we prefer planting green. We like to use the plant, the growing plant, to help dry the soil to make soil conditions as good as they can be as we're planting. Um, we like to keep the carbon accumulation, <coughs> the photosynthesis, all that going as long as possible. We, we want that living root out there as close as possible to the next crop so that the microbes, there's a, you know, they've got something there to work on consistently. So. We tend to plant green more than brown, but there are reasons and situations where you, you, you might prefer the other. Planting brown is just where we kill it ahead and plant into it after it's brown. And as with most things in life, attitude is everything. I was out scouting one day and I saw that and I thought that was a pretty good metaphor for what we're trying to do a lot of days on the farm and, and uh, you, you just got to, you know, have the attitude we're going to make it work.